Hello, friends. Uh, thank you for watching the dialogues format uh, in my YouTube channel. Channel here, I always invite only authoritative and uh, independently thinking people. And today, Mr. Bill Boring is my guest. Uh, Mr. Boring is uh, the professor of law from Great Britain, United Kingdom, who specializes in human rights, international law minority rights, Soviet and Russian law. Thank you very much, Bill, for the for your willingness to take part in the interview and readiness, share your opinion with our audio audience. So I should add that I'm also a practicing barrister and I'm taking cases to the European Court of Human Rights since the early 90s. So I'm in practice and I also act as an expert in quite a lot of um, asylum appeals and extradition requests, uh, particularly those relating to the Russian Federation, but Ukraine as well. It's great because it's uh, we, we extremely need your opinion on the uh, law situation with international law, with uh, uh, possible Ukrainian claims to Russia, uh, and uh, I think it should be very interesting for our uh, viewers to, to such dialogue. As a person who has been uh, dealing with international law and human rights all his life, were you surprised by the rude and direct Russian invasion of Ukraine, which Russia did not even try to somehow camouflage uh, with the rule of law or reference to it? Well, so can I say that uh, actually I've been going to Ukraine since 1992 and the first place was Donetsk. Now, I was working for several years in Crimea uh, for the OSC and then UNHCR on the question of the Crimean Tatars. And I met you for the first time on the question of the Russian language in Ukraine. So I was part of a large project and I've published articles with uh, Kiev Mihila uh, University and others. And I've been going to Russia since 1983. So First of all, in answer to your question, uh, the invasion did not start in February of this year. Um, it started in 2014 when Russia annexed uh, Crimea. And of course, in 2014, at that point, immediately after the Maidan events in Kiev, uh, Ukraine did not have an army, actually. And Russia was able to take um, Crimea without uh, bloodshed, and the West and uh, Kiev's friend, uh, Ukraine's friends basically did nothing. And even the Council of Europe did a deal with Russia uh, in 2019 and removed sanctions. So uh, I've published a chapter uh, in a collection edited actually by my Ukrainian friends on the question of the Russian legal justifications for the annexation of Crimea, and they did make legal justifications. I mean, they were the opposite to the legal submissions Russia made in the Kosovo case in the International Court of Justice, so that was interesting. <clears throat> and my article also deals with the question of the Crimean Tatars, particularly since I've been involved with them for so long. So um, I think uh, the regime in Russia believed because they got away with the annexation of Crimea and there were basically no consequences. At the same time, of course, Russia supported the separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk. As I say, the first place I visited in Ukraine was Donetsk. And I returned to Donetsk with two um, OSCE High Commissioners on National Minorities, and we had many meetings and so on. I did not detect any, no, um, desire to uh, join Russia, not. Um, and so I found enthusiasm for studying Ukrainian language um, in these primarily Russian-speaking areas. However, it was very clear that Russia from 2014 was providing weapons and supplies to these breakaways, even though they were both led by gangsters, some of whom have since killed each other. 
Um, and so therefore, in the period from 2014, Ukraine has developed a professional army, which it did not have before, and has had practice fighting uh, the Russian-backed separatists. And of course, part of what happened was the tragedy with MH17, where a number of people have now been convicted of shooting down the airline and killing all the passengers using Russian equipment. So that's one of the things that was going on. So uh, when Russia started putting enormous numbers of troops around the border with Belarus and the border with Russia, uh, it was clear to me and to quite a lot of people that Russia was planning to intensify the invasion that was already taking place. And then we had the uh, long rambling speech by President Putin on the 21st of February, uh, sitting behind a desk in a big round room with the senior members of the Russian government and armed forces standing on the other end of the room where he did not mention NATO, and he went on and on about Lenin uh, and the right to self-determination, and that Lenin had created for the purpose of destroying Russia an artificial state which has no right to exist. So from the 21st, it was quite clear to me uh, that there was going to be an invasion. You know, And you cannot keep such a huge number of troops and equipment on the border Indefinitely, you go, you're going to have to use them. And so there were people who were surprised indeed. But me and the people I know, I know, we were not surprised at all. What we were surprised was that after Ukraine, as I say, had developed a proper army, professional army, um, and had experience of fighting Russian-backed separatists since 2014, I think what really surprised me was that uh, President Putin thought he could have a repeat of Crimea and there would be no bloodshed. He would get rid of President Zelensky, install Yanukovych back in Kiev, and everything would be fine in a few days. Or that he would have a repeat of Georgia in 2008, where basically the Georgian army ran away. So, or that he would have a repeat of uh, Chechnya, which was a colonial war within Russia, um, and that was when Putin first became prime minister, then acting president, or uh, his success in Syria, where President Assad is only still in power because of Russian support. Um, that's a fact, uh, Russia and Iran. So President Putin made a massive mistake, as we know. And the fact that the war is still going on, it was not finished in five days, and Russia has suffered terrible losses, actually. And what I say, um, finally, as in answer to your question, is that Putin has two great achievements. He's really had two huge successes. One is he brought NATO back to life because NATO was dead actually, completely discredited. The United States didn't want to fund it anymore. So Putin has magically brought NATO back to life. Sweden and Norway, which were neutral, are joining it. And Russia will now have a much longer border with NATO, all the way down Finland. And Finland has a history of defeating the Soviet Union in 1939. So uh, I think a very bad move. And that my, the second massive achievement of Putin is that he saved Zelensky. Uh, because Zelensky, who had been a comic actor in the television program owned by Mr. Kolomoisky, who was thought to be uh, somehow the puppet of Mr. Kolomoisky, but then the servant of the People pa uh, Party had this huge success in the election. He was elected promising to beat corruption. And actually, by February of this year, he was becoming very unpopular. And so Mr. Putin saved him. And Zelensky now has the best role of his life. He's doing it very brilliantly. Every evening, there he is in his battle dress T-shirt, uh, giving his uh, daily speech. And 
So I think those are two massive achievements by Mr. Putin. But uh, so in short answer to your question, I was not surprised at all, no. And it's been going on since 2014. Uh, yes, you're right, but uh, there are much ma- uh, more, uh, much more uh, consequences of this uh, doings of Putin, of course. And for me, for like Ukrainian expert, of course, it's very bad that uh, the war is going on on the territory of Ukraine. The Putin troops uh, broke a lot in Ukraine infrastructure, they killed a lot of people, they uh, destroyed a lot of cities and villages, uh, so our losses uh, are extremely great. Moreover, Putin used used this war to clean uh, opposition inside of Russia. And uh, Putin used this war to uh, to kill any uh, competence uh, between the oligarchs and power. All oligarchs in Russia now is is absolutely dependent from Kremlin uh, nowadays. No oppositions, economical oppositions, political oppositions. Uh, Putin uh, made a very heavy strike uh, to the European Union uh, economy, uh, especially, because the European Union without Russian energy uh, is not very... uh, competitive in international markets nowadays. And the uh, United States and China used a lot of this situation in international markets because of energy price in European Union and Great Britain, I know. So uh, also, so uh, they have also not bad, uh, but uh, they have also good for Russia results. Talking about the situation, about the Russian military trainee, trainees before the war, uh, uh, I remember that it happens uh, two times per year, every year. Uh, it, uh, this this trainees, uh, Russian military trainees, was not uh, was not only uh, in 2021 or 2022. Every year, two times a year, they uh, go to Belarus and make a trainee. So many people in Ukraine and not only in Ukraine believes. Uh, that it was only a blackmailing of Ukrainian uh, government, Ukrainian president, uh, that Putin is, was going on to only to push uh, the Zelensky to accept the Minsk agreement, to Im- implement the Minsk agreement. Many people uh, bro- uh, around the world uh, thought like this. Me personally, of course, um, I... Mm, uh, I said that uh, that will be war in December uh, 2021. I uh, I saw that uh, there is a lot of preparation for war, not only about trainees, but also a political preparation, I- I- uh, ideology preparation. Talking about the Putin's articles in for in Russian medias, many preparation. But uh, I think uh, there was a small chance. Uh, to uh, to do to not not put this war going on uh, in this situation. We haven't used it in so, this. So, case. what is your question? And uh, I, I'm we are just talking, and I am talking. Uh, I want to ask you um, about the uh, international law this uh, this time also. Uh, at the same time, uh, Russian Federation has not formally withdrawn from international agreements guaranteeing the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries, respect for human rights. What kind of game is it? Has the Russian Federation finally uh, broken these norms for itself, or uh, is it uh, simply bending them at the angle of her needs? after all, uh, we should remember that uh, all these international law norms, uh, they are children, like a children of K international organizations, such as United Nations, Council of Europe, OSCE, and many, many others. Is Russia, trying, is Russia trying to destroy this entire international scope of law uh, or the organization uh, that created it? How do you think? Okay, that's a very, very long question, but uh, no, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so for, first of all, a few years ago, China and Russia made a joint declaration on international law, 
saying that they were the countries that were really supporting international law and the United Nations Charter. And as I was saying earlier, in 2014, Russia did put forward legal justifications for the annexation of Crimea. Uh, and there was a referendum, very uh, controversial, and Crimea supposedly asked to become part of the Russian Federation, etc. So, read my chapter, so, and I take all of those arguments apart. What is very interesting for me is that the uh, events in February of this year have nothing to do with international law, so far as Russia is concerned. That's why I say Mr. Putin is an imperialist, and his objective is to rebuild the Russian Empire. And what he says is that Lenin was a paid German agent. Working, he says this over and over again, uh, that Lenin destroyed the, the great Russian Empire, that Lenin put an atomic bomb under the Soviet Union, but Putin does not want to restore the Soviet Union because, of course, under the Soviet Constitution, the Union Republics, including Ukraine, had the right to leave. And Lenin insisted on that before his death. And strangely enough, that was never taken out of the Constitution, right up until the end of the Soviet Union in 1991. And everyone forgets that in 1945, Ukraine and Belarus were founder members of the United Nations with membership of the, of the General Assembly as independent states, as union republics, with the right to leave. And this, for Putin, of course, on the one hand, Stalin for him is the greatest Tsar, uh, greater even than Ivan Grozny or Pyotr Pyerby or Yekaterina Toraya, because under Stalin, the Russian Empire reached its greatest extent. Half of Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, the three Baltic states, you know, Poland, I mean, Poland was in the Russian Empire in the 19th century, but under Stalin, the Russian Empire reached its largest size. Putin has recently been making speeches where he says that the countries Russia, that the territory Russia gained in the Great Northern War against Sweden is still part of Russia, as far as he's concerned. So the territory on which St. Petersburg now stands and the three Baltic countries if I was in Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania, I would be really scared. And I'm quite sure in Putin's mind, Poland is still part of the Russian Empire, by the way. And so Ukraine comes into his mind, not as a sovereign state, no. It was a completely artificial creation by Lenin to harm Russia, because Lenin was in the pay of Germany. So, you know, Putin, in my opinion, has lost it completely. But he's very dangerous. And that's because, you know, people who say, oh, it's all NATO. So, uh, 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 because I started taking cases in the European Court of Human Rights in the year 2000, after Putin started a colonial war in Chechnya, nothing to do with NATO. He said, he said, okay, and demolished Grozny to the ground. And my clients were women whose children were killed when a refugee column, civilians who were told they could leave on a safe route, were bombed. So did that have anything to do with NATO? No, it didn't. But it was the same method, that is raising cities to the ground, which uh, Putin used in Chechnya, uh, then he's used in Syria, now he's using in Ukraine. But this is imperialism. It has nothing to do with um, state sovereignty. That's why we hear no legal justifications uh, for uh, the events of February of this year. None. None. What we hear is politics, i.e. restoring the Russian Empire. Um, so that's why there is no possibility of any deal between Ukraine and Russia. How could there be? Uh, because Russia in Putin's mind, uh, Ukraine in Putin's mind does not exist. 
Um, we are, we are, we are, uh, let me just say also, real some uh, real disaster for Russians is being expelled from the European Convention and Court of Human Rights. Actually, Britain is following Russia's example, but that's a different question. Uh, Russia earlier followed Britain's example um, in defying the European Court. But for me, the tragedy is <clears throat> that 140 million people in Russia have lost the chance to appeal to Strasbourg. There were many changes in Russian law as a result of cases at Strasbourg. Every decision of the Constitutional Court in St. Petersburg contained references to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And actually, tragically, Russia had just elected a really good judge, a friend of mine, Mikhail Lobov. But of course, on the 16th of September, that was the end. Actually, I won a big case against Russia on the 21st of September, 2021, that was the Litvinenko case called Carter against Russia. And after 14 years, I got a judgment on behalf of my client that her husband was murdered by the Kremlin, by Russia. You know, so <laughs> I, I, now that's finished. And basically Russia in, in, in as I say, Russia invaded Ukraine already. Uh, that was going on since 2014. But Russia now acts in flagrant violation of the UN Charter. Absolutely flagrant. So, you know, I teach my student, I teach a course on public international law and use of force. And the use of force is prohibited by the UN Charter, except where authorized by the Security Council or in self defense. Uh, Ukraine did not attack Russia. Sorry about that. Yeah. It looks like Russia go out from all the international architecture of uh, international law and international treatments, uh, which was made after the Second World War. And uh, it looks like Russia uh, trying to back all the world to the time before the Second World War. Or exactly. Or even earlier, before even b before the First World, World War, where there was no any world architecture, a strong official public world, world, world architecture of law, of international human rights system, something like this. Well, I would say, you see, that China and India are both being very cautious. And China and India do not want this architecture to be broken up. Mm. And for most states, uh, the architecture is still important. I mean, you know, the Security Council desperately needs reform. Of course, it's ridiculous that the five permanent members are the winning side in the Second World War. That has got to change. Of course it has. However, 193 countries are represented in the General Assembly, and they have a voice. And periodically, they serve on the Security Council. And we absolutely, the world cannot continue. Well, maybe we're all dead anyway because of climate change. But we're certainly dead even quicker if there is no world body with representation for big states and small states. So, and uh, by the way, you were one, one thing I did want to pick up on. You said there's no opposition in Russia. This is not true. No, there's no, been, no, no, no. Wait, wait a second. They, uh, been, wait, a, wait a second. So there's been serious repression, even worse than before. Yeah, yeah. So my parents-in-law live around Moscow. My wife's parents have been married to a Russian for 22 years now. And they are desperate. They are among millions of people who hate the regime, who used to watch Tevye uh, Dodge, who used to listen to Radio Echo Moscovy, who used to read Novia, Novia Gazeta, which you used to be able to buy all over Russia everywhere and so all they're out uh, and the television as you know people under 25 don't watch it in russia anyway and it's it's the most ridiculous propaganda so in a country now where if you call what's going on a war you go to prison for 15 years this is a limited this is a special military operation to denazify and demilitarize ukraine denazify Putin's ideology, as I've written in my book, 
is the ideology of the Nazi legal theorist Carl Schmitt and the people around him. And there are lots of Nazis working in Russia. And to call say, Mr. Zelensky, whatever you think of him, he's Jewish. Uh, the Jerusalem Post says he's the Jew of the year. His grandparents were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, I'm presently doing a case, uh, an asylum appeal, <clears throat> where my client is the wife of a senior um, Georgian officer um, who was uh, uh, working with uh, former President Saakashvili, who, as you know, spent some time in Ukraine. But uh, the, uh, my client's husband went on to fight in Azovstal and was not a Nazi, sorry about that. And as you know, they heroically fought for months longer than anyone thought they could in Azovstal, and many of them have now been returned to Ukraine by Russia as part of prisoner exchanges. And for, Putin, for Russian television to say that Ukraine has been taken over by Nazis, really? I mean, and actually Ukraine is, despite everything, a kind of democracy. You cannot predict who's going to win the election oh. in Ukraine. Hold, we can't wait a second. And so I have quite a few, I have a lot of friends in Russia. Mm -hmm. With there are protests, you know, and pe people, are, and thousands and thousands of young people have been arrested, beaten up, spent time in prison, come out again. And I think this is one of the biggest threats to Putin because Russia has a history of young anarchists. Many of the people who've been sent to prison are actually young anarchists. And they're coming out again. So the pussy riot, I, in my opinion, with the Norodnya Volya of today, but they weren't assassinating um, leading politicians in the way that Norodnya Volya did in the 19th century. I think Putin lives in fear Actually, you know, Russia is that kind of a country. Uh, the regime thinks that they've put the lid on and screwed it down tight and nothing can happen. But my a word I like very much in the Russian language is stichinist, stichini, mm -hmm. which is wrongly translated into English as spontaneity or spontane. No. no, stichinist no. is when the ground is rumbling under your feet and the volcano is likely to erupt. And I think in Russia, if you remember Pugachev, which nobody expected um, in the 18th century, and then the uprisings in the 19th century, and then, of course, the Bolshevik uh, Revolution, really, but, but, I, I would say that... It, so I, I have a whole number of telegram channels mm -hmm. which were reporting from all over Russia daily of okay. really heroic, you know. but, but, but there is a big problem. You know, we have a lot of such historical examples in Russian history, but all of them, not most of them, even all of them was move, movements to gather in Russian states, to make Russian states stronger, not weaker, not liberal, not more democracy. Look oh, not, not, no, 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 disagree. No? Disagree, absolutely disagree. Yeah. Because the, the, Bolshev, the Bolshevik revolution was Putin. Putin wanted to become a Tsar, Lenin wanted to become a new Tsar. Uh, who else? Hold on, hold on, not true. Lenin had no intention of becoming a new Tsar. I think Stalin murdered him, uh, by the way. And as you know, the last big struggle between Lenin and Stalin was over Georgia. Because Lenin was in favor, was sincerely in favor of self determination of nations. Lenin Hold on, wait, 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 wait. Lenin wanted to no, become wait. a Tsar of Let Europe. Me Let me finish. Yeah. So, in uh, 1919, Lenin put self determination into practice in the Russian Empire. Finland became independent. The three Baltic states became independent. Poland became independent. Georgia would have become independent, even though the Mensheviks would be in power, except that Lenin died. You know, so that was a massive battle between, so Lenin had lots of blood on his hands. So Tambov, Kronstadt, I don't for a moment say that this, was, wait, wait a second. Mm -hmm. But so far as Putin's concerned, Lenin destroyed the Russian empire. I say again, Putin has said this over and over again. 
Um, Lenin, unlike Woodrow Wilson, was in favor of breaking up the Western colonial empires. And I would say that the breakup of the British Empire, which was fantastically bloody, we killed millions of people in the last years of the British Empire, French Empire, you know, the Spanish, um, Portuguese. Lenin was in favor of breaking up all of those empires. So, and he was sincere about that. Or and what? The, the other thing, the, wait a second. What, what, what wait, was the of Lenin? Wait a second. <laughs> and for, the other thing Lenin did was to reintroduce capitalism into Russia. So the new economic policy, who stopped that? Uh, by the way, I think Trotsky would have been worse than Stalin had he come to power, because Stalin was in favor of turning workers into soldiers. Uh, Trotsky was, sorry, and had a big battle with Lenin over that. But with the um, new economic policy, in fact, capitalism was restored in Russia under state control. When did that come to an end? It came to an end with Stalin and his turn. And Holodomor, as you know, murder of millions of uh, farmers in Russia as well, a uh, collectivization, but one of the many massive crimes of Stalin, and socialism in one country as a prison. You know, so uh, I would say that actually it was 1927-1928. And Stalin, of course, was an emperor. That's why Putin respects him. That's why Stalin is being restored in Russian history books as a great Tsar, like uh, Ivan Grozny, like Peter I, like Catherine. So a, and somebody who built the Russian Empire, as I said before, into the biggest territory it ever had. But, of course, Lenin had no intent. Why, why did Lenin... Um, advocate and then bring about the breaking away of many territories of the Russian Empire. And of course, the, there was the Tatars and the Far East were all of them separating. And that was brought to an end by Stalin, of course. So I do think that um, a lot of people have a strange idea, of, strange idea of history and don't understand why Putin, why, why Putin goes on and on about Lenin. Uh, Bill, I, I, I absolutely disagree. Uh, I am agree with you about the Stalin, uh, but I am not, uh, in don't, I am, uh, I am not agree with you about the Lenin because uh, Lenin uh, lose the Finland, Poland because uh, Russia lose the war in that time. No, and once, wrong. And moreover, just a second. And uh, one another from another way, Lenin uh, was uh, thought about the world communist revolution. He wanted, uh, Le Lenin was thought about, he was thinking about, he, he wanted to make a world communist revolution, world a revolution, world, 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 world revolution. A world Re revolution, okay. World revolution, around, yeah. revolution around the world. He wanted, he wanted to make a all general world empire, communist empire. No, 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 wrong. Yeah. Uh, no, no, uh, Stalin. No, so, Ruslan, you, you no, no, are no, completely no, no. wrong. Give, on give that. me a second. Give me a second. Uh, Stalin broke this idea. Stalin, Stalin broke uh, uh, so called international communist movements, the four internationals, and so called. Stalin postponed this idea. Stalin made a Russian empire, but Lenin wanted to make a global communist empire, for my opinion. No, you're completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely wrong. So, but yes. I read all the Lenin. I read all the Lenin. No, you didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, and the fact is that after the, during at the beginning of the First World War, mm -hmm. of course, that was the end of the Second International, because although the Second International, including Germany, Britain, etc., were against war, they all joined their respective countries in the war. So that was the end of the Second International. So, so far as Lenin was concerned, you could not have socialism in one country, and he was totally against empires. And by the way, Britain, at the end of the First World War, of course, the German Empire was broken up, and Britain then had territories in half of Africa. Uh, France was, 
And you know that during the Second World War, Britain murdered three million people in Bengal. We created a Holodomor. That was Winston Churchill, who was an imperialist. And by the way, the British Empire is still, we murdered huge numbers of people in Malaysia, and <clears throat> as did the French in Algeria, uh, in Indochina. But Lenin was actually in favor of the people of the nations becoming independent and breaking away from the empires. And he had Lenin, you will not find anywhere, anywhere, I guarantee, in his writings that he wanted to create a world empire. Nonsense. And Stalin, actually, the reason Stalin had such you a big fight with Lenin. Stalin also. Sorry? You Sorry? will not find such words in Stalin also, but we're talking not about words, we're talking about thoughts. I'm sorry? Uh, but we know, uh, you will not find such words about the empire in Stalin's uh, articles also. No, but, but Stalin, Stalin did but say... But we're talking not about it, words, we're talking about thoughts. Thoughts. About? We're talking about thoughts. Thought. Thoughts. Thought. Thought. Okay, thoughts. Stalin and Stalin. The thing was that Stalin said and wrote... The, I've got his books here that you could have socialism in one country, i.e. Russia, um, that it was possible to have socialism in Russia without a world revolution. And I've, I've been to Potsdam and sat uh, and been to the room where Churchill, Stalin and Roosevelt sat down at the end of the Second World War and carved up Europe. So they said the West could have Greece, and the communists were murdered in Greece in huge numbers, and Stalin did nothing. At the same time, the West said Stalin could have Hungary and Czechoslovakia. And so, as you know, there was, to begin with, democracy in Czechoslovakia, and then there was a communist coup. And, you know, so under Stalin, and then, of course, in 1956, the Soviet tanks went into Budapest, 1968, the Soviet tanks went into Prague, you know, and so far as the uh, Stalin was concerned, um, those states were not independent states. In the same way that for Putin, Ukraine is not an independent state. Ukraine has no right to exist and only exists because of Lenin. <sighs> Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, what uh, we we started to talk about the uh, United Kingdom. What do you think uh, uh, we uh, United Kingdom and Ukraine? What we didn't not to do to avoid this war or uh, this war? It is it is only exclusive the ty tyranny on one person uh, of uh, of madness of one person of me Vladimir Putin. What we could do maybe in the in the past to avoid this war, or, or or it was impossible. Right. So, I don't think for a moment it's one person. I think in Russia, you have a secret police state. That is the difference between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine, you have oligarchs, of course, and huge corruption. So, Mr. Filtas, Mr. Golomoysky, Mr. Poroshenko are fighting it out in Ukraine. But it's not a secret police state in Ukraine, actually. In Russia, it is a state of the KGB, now called the FSB, which is bigger than it was even in the Soviet Union, where they think they can murder people in England, for example, with no consequence, using Novichok. You know, so it's a secret police state of thieves. It's called a kleptocracy. And so Mr. Navalny, um, who is a nationalist, of course, and he's not a politician. Uh, he's an anti-corruption campaigner. But I thought when he returned to Russia, knowing he would be arrested with a film called Dvaryes de Putina, which maybe you've seen, which has been watched by more times in Russia than there is population in Russia, proving that Putin has stolen a fantastic amount of money Trillions, I mean, and the people around him. So uh, it's not Putin. If Putin goes tomorrow, and he's very ill, I mean, that's quite clear. What really scares people in Russia is what will take his place. Well, it will still be a regime of secret police. 
you know, so this is what um, Soldato from Borghina, um, you know, in a very good book called The New Nobility, you know, and Putin changed the uniforms of the KGB to black, you know, so it was uh, FSB. So this is, I don't think we've seen this in the world before, a state where the secret police is in power. So um, I think that for the whole world, this is a really serious threat, particularly when it's a secret police state with nuclear weapons, where the uh, state threatens to use them in Ukraine. Okay, that would be great for Ukraine. You already had um, Chernobyl, and I was in the Soviet Union in 1986, uh, at the time of Chernobyl. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was driving actually in southern Russia and the Caucasus, and we were stopped to have our wheels sprayed and checked with Geiger counters. But that is nothing compared with what will happen if Russia uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine, which they're threatening to do. Uh, so I, I say this is not the Russian people, not for a moment. As I say, you know, Moscow is probably 15 million people of whom at least six million hate the regime, including my parents-in-law and everyone they know, actually. And they're so, I mean, afraid and ashamed of what is being done in the name of Russia, but it is really horrible. But uh, I'm speaking to you from a country where the regime in power at the moment wants us already, wants us to leave the European Convention on Human Rights also, like Russia, you know, and violating international law, have been told by the United Nations that what we're proposing to do, we want to drown asylum seekers uh, or subject them to horrific conditions. We're told we're breaking international law. So in Britain, I'm still able to talk more or less freely, and the police are not knocking at my door. But we now have more protesters in prison than at any time in our history. Young people, mostly, and climate protesters. Uh, as you know, that I've been on strike for three days in the past month. I will have a lot of money taken out of my pay. 151 universities have been on strike already and will be striking more. Nurses are on strike uh, tomorrow. Ambulance drivers, railway workers are on strike. Uh, this is not um, Stalin or Lenin, nor is it Bortnik even, you know. <laughs> so, but this is because we have a regime in England of the extreme right, like in Hungary, like in Israel now. And the thing is that, thing is that at the moment, they say very hypocritically that they are supporting uh, Ukraine and they are providing some support. And Britain is actually not subject to Russian gas. You know, we have other, other sources of, however, the, the price of fuel and the price of food, for reasons not to do with the war in Ukraine, to, reasons to do with fantastic stealing on the part, you know, we now have more billionaires in England since COVID. So many people have stolen billions uh, from the public during the COVID pandemic. Every country has its problems, by the way. Okay. And, and, we still, and we still have an empire, by the way. I mean, if you study international law, you will know that um, in 2019, the International Court of Justice found against the United Kingdom in relation to the Chagos Islands, um, where we are defying international law. Um, and we still have a colony in the Indian Ocean, which we created in 1965. And we still have territories all over the world, which are used for money laundering. You know, British Virgin Islands, Gibraltar, Isle of Man, Channel Islands. You know, Britain is the centre of dirty money. So every country has its problems. You know, Ukraine, I weep because I know Ukraine so well. Really, I know, I know Crimea. As you know, I know Donetsk. I've been there many times. I met you in Kiev. I have a question, Bill. Uh, how do you think uh, if the West con Western countries like uh, United States, uh, Great Britain gave this scope of weapon uh, for Ukraine before the war, 
Putin will uh, intervent Ukraine or not? It could not possibly have happened. And as you know, um, until America is now two countries. There is a civil war in America. I know. It's going on now. And so, 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 so Trump, Trump did not want, Trump wanted to break up NATO, actually. And Trump is still there with a massive following. So there is a civil war taking place in America now. So anyone who says, oh, American empire, so really? France, as you know, uh, has deep crisis. Germany at the moment um, is in a really bad place. Uh, Germany, of course, cannot decide. And that is because Angela Merkel did very cozy deals with uh, Russia over gas. So Germany becomes completely dependent on, on Russian gas. And that, that was such a bad policy. But every know, country one, has its own... One more question from the other side, uh, because uh, you, I am very lucky to, to, to speak today with you. We, we have no such type of dialogue inside of Ukraine you know, because of situation uh, in our country, because of intervention. One more question. How do you think if, uh, if the balance between the Russia and the West, Ukrainian balance, which were, were worked in our country till... Uh, 2014 till Maidan, till annexation of Crimea, if that balance will be will be uh, saved, uh, this, this situation should be happened or not? Well, you see, one thing we have not mentioned yet was Russia saying that four oblasts of Ukraine are now part of Russia. Yeah. Yeah, including Kherson. Yeah. And they had so-called referendums, and Russia annexed them. Russia annexed them. Actually, when the Ukrainian army goes into Kherson Oblast, as far as Russia is concerned, that is an invasion of Russia. So in, Russia says Ukraine is now invading Russian territory. And that's a circumstance in which Russia threatens to use nuclear weapons against uh, Ukraine. So it's not just Luhansk and Donetsk, it's also uh, uh, Zaporizhia and it's also um, Kherson, are all part of Russia now, by the way. And so I'm not saying this is the first time that there's been a egregious violation of international law. So my book, which is now in Russian as well, um, on the degradation of the international legal order, uh, published in Russia last year, um, has on the front cover the bombing of Baghdad. And so in the Middle East, we are still suffering the consequence of the absolutely illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq by Britain and America, war crimes. So I'm one of the people who's been trying to get the International Criminal Court to prosecute Tony Blair and the people around him for war crimes. I mean, and the Masses of people have died in Iraq as a result of Britain and America's illegal action. That's not the only one. But so, the United States and Britain haven't an annexed uh, Iraq or another territory. No, like we, Russia. we occupied it and we, lost, and we murdered civilians. So there were cases at the Europe of Human Rights, which Britain lost. And what Britain did in the south of Iraq which was the British occupied, we gave it to Iran. So it's Iran that now rules the southern part of Iraq. And as you know, what's going on in Baghdad is a continuing war between Iran and um, the uh, Daesh and the Sunnis, and of course the Kurds in the northern part of Iraq. So the consequences of the illegal invasion and occupation by Britain and America is chaos in the Middle East. I would say this has a lot to do with what's going on in Syria. So why is Russia supporting Assad? Because Assad would not be there if it weren't for Russian Air Force demolishing Syrian cities where the opposition is. Does Russia like Assad? No, not at all. Russia is there to have a naval base in the Mediterranean, which it has got. And this is completely disrupting Israel, is completely disrupting Iran, which is fighting with Russia in Syria. Turkey has now invaded part of Syria illegally, by the way. 
Why has Turkey invaded Syria? It's because of the Kurds who were dumped by Trump. Trump threw the Kurds under a bus, as you know. So I'm saying all over the world, look at Africa, look at Latin America. Um, so this is not the only example, but I do think that uh, a country with nuclear weapons annexing 20% of a sovereign state, saying that that sovereign state does not exist, and was created by an evil German agent called Vladimir Ulyanov. Okay, and this is what Putin says over and over again. I think this is fantastically dangerous. So Chernobyl, we could not eat meat in Britain for several years after Chernobyl uh, because of the radioactive grass. Um, and, you know, if, if there is use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine now, um, I think... Western Europe will become uninhabitable, by the yeah. way. How, how did the British society react to the invasion, uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine? British society is, by the way, <clears throat> half of the population voted for Brexit. Yeah. On the basis of xenophobia, of hating foreigners in particular. Don't forget there were many wars between Britain and France. When you read the right-wing papers in Britain, you would think there is still a war between Britain and France. So half of the population voted for Brexit, which has done huge damage. Everyone is much poorer in Britain as a result. Who supported Brexit? Putin put huge money into, and the Conservative Party was bought by Russia. By the way, Boris Johnson received hundreds of thousands of pounds. You know who Boris Johnson made a lord in the House of Lords? No, I don't know. Ye Yevgeny Lebedev. Oh. And so Lebedev is now Lord Lebedev mm -hmm. of somewhere in Siberia. And his, who was his father? Still alive? He was the top KGB agent in Russia during the Cold War. So Johnson comes to Kiev and makes a performance with Zelensky. Actually, his party was bought by Russia. And that's why when we had uh, two GRU agents in Britain to murder um, uh, um, uh, Scribba and his daughter, and um, actually some people died as a result, and it was quite clear what that was Russia, what was our reaction? So weak. And we had British Petroleum with 19% of Rosneft, of stolen goods. Now they're saying, oh, well, maybe that's a problem. 2014, they kept it and made huge profits. So Britain is seen by Russia as a complete joke, where the ruling party was bought by Russia a long time ago, you know, where actually we have the biggest uh, Russian Secret Service presence in Britain, um, well, much bigger than in the Cold War. Uh, we have uh, Ross um with huge amounts of money buying the Russian population. So we, we have, where I live in Colchester, which is a small city, about 200,000, we have two Orthodox churches. One is anti-Putin, the other one is pro-Putin, and the pro-Putin church receives huge amounts of money. You know, so... Britain's response all the way through has been pretty weak, actually. So the population as a whole, uh, which is your question, most of them haven't a clue. They really don't know. They don't even know where Ukraine is. Mm -hmm. You know, and Britain actually at the moment has its own, as well as Brexit, Scotland now has a very strong independence movement. And I think Scotland will leave quite soon. Ireland, I've just been to Belfast and Dublin. Now the Sinn Féin party, which were called terrorists, they are now the biggest party in Northern Ireland, and they're becoming the biggest party in the Republic. And now Britain will not be able to stop unification of Ireland. In Wales, there is a Labour government um, under devolution, and now there's more and more. Then we will have England by itself, which will have to decide what it's going to be. And by the way, in my lifetime, I'm quite old now, so I've seen the former Yugoslavia, uh, the former Czechoslovakia, the former Soviet Union, 
the former GDR. Soon there will be the former UK. F U K. In maybe, my lifetime. And former uh, former Russia, maybe. I'm sorry. And former Russia. Well, you know maybe. what people are terrified of in Russia. Of course, if Putin dies tomorrow, many people are scared the country will break up. Because I've been in Khabarovsk. I've been in Yekaterinburg. Many people think, why the bloody hell are we sending so much money to Moscow? And if you're in Khabarovsk or Vladivostok, <coughs> all of your connections are with China and Japan and America. And, you know, actually, I think people think who would, if Putin dies tomorrow, A, Russia itself may break up. You know, so the Soviet Union broke up in uh, 1991 and we had 15 new countries. Um, but, uh, you know, my wife is Tatar. And there are 5 million Tatars in Russia, 3 million in, in Tatarstan, where they still have a president, despite Putin saying they can't have a president, where actually um, it's, the standard of living in Kazan is much better than in Moscow even. Uh, and where, as you know, they are Turkic people speaking a Turkic language, they are Muslims. And actually, Russia, uh, Moscow is one of the biggest Muslim cities in the world uh, by population of Muslims. And I, I think Russians think this will be the Sputna, Smutnaya Vremia again. Maybe. Uh, uh, how do you think? Uh, will uh, Rishi Sunak continue the policy? Uh, of Boris Johnson and Liz Trust uh, to support of Ukraine, because well, Ukraine don't forget we had we had three prime ministers this year. Yeah, three. Okay, so Johnson, it was complete hypocrisy because he was receiving personally hundreds of thousands of pounds from Russians, and his party was bought by Russia. But Liz Trust lasted. Wait, wait a second. Wait, wait a second. So Liz Trust lasted for a very short time. And she actually, she went to uh, Russia and told Mr. Lavrov that Voronezh and Rostov Nadanu are cities in Ukraine. Yeah. And Lavrov said it was like a deaf person talking to a mute person, really. Then we have um, Mr. Sunak, who is the richest person in, he has 187 million pounds. Oh. And by far the richest person in part. He's married the daughter of the richest person in India. All his life he's been extremely privileged. He has no, and he is saying nurses who've had their pay cut by 20% in the past 10 years, now should, uh, inflation is more than 10%, nurses should have 4% increase, and that's a big pay cut. That's why the nurses, for the first time in 140 years, are on strike now. You know, it's class war in Britain. And so m most people they have no, I mean, they can't eat and they can't feed their homes. People are having to rely on free food from food banks. You know, my wife works three 12-hour shifts a week in the hospital also herself. And the people, so, but she has me. I mean, people who are trying to live on the money they get, they cannot feed and heat their, feed their children and heat their homes. So it's that kind of a situation in uh, England as a result of government policies. So Ukraine hardly figures. And I think most people asked where Ukraine is, they wouldn't know. I mean, really. And people also hate foreign, you know, half of the population hates foreigners so much. Uh, I you know, and also we have in the past, um, very recent past, uh, we have the fact that the population has completely changed. I mean, uh, when I came to Colchester 20 years ago, the entire population was white. Now the majority of kids in school have black and brown skins. So it's like London. And the big cities in England have completely changed. So, and the way one explains this is they are here in England because we were there. They did not invite us to their countries to go and steal from them and kill them and make them into slaves, uh, which we did in our history. So England, and also England uh, 10 years ago was a Christian country. Now Christians are in the minority. 
most people are atheist. Muslims are about 4%, you know, but are growing. In such a situation, how do you think who will win the parliamentary election in the United Kingdom in 2024? At the moment, Labour is 24 points ahead. Mm -hmm. And Keir Starmer, I know extremely well, uh, mm -hmm. because for about 10 years, I was chair of the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, and he was the secretary. He never talks about that now, of course. Then he became the chief prosecutor for five years. And so he would like to run England in the way that he ran the prosecution service, you know, as an efficient organization. Mm -hmm. But he's not a socialist. Of course, it's a slight problem leaving the Labour Party, nor does he have anything to do with trade unions. He's against trade unions, actually. But the Labour Party was founded by trade unions to defend the trade unions, and they still provide most of the money. So I think Labour at the present, the Conservatives are petrified. And another reason is they are losing all of the by-elections. Uh, Johnson and many others will lose their seats. I mean, with Labour 24 points ahead. And Conservatives are now threatened by the extreme right. So the UKIP party, which helped to win Brexit, is now called the Reform Party, and they are getting 9% of the vote from the Conservatives on an extreme right uh, platform, uh, led by Nigel Farage, um, who accepted huge amounts of money from Russia also. You know, it's uh, the extreme right all across Europe, in France, in Germany, funded by... And of course, why did Russia fund Brexit? It was to weaken the European Union. Of course. So, and they succeeded. So uh -huh. I, I would say in 2024, If there's not an election before then, we are going to have big riots again. We have big riots in London every 10 years. Uh, and then a lot of buildings are burnt down, etc. You know, and the last ones in 2012 was all over the country. Mm -hmm. So I would say with the way things are now developing, so many young people in prison being arrested, climate protesters in particular, and the government is now going to introduce legislation to make strikes illegal, and we're going to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. So uh, I think all across the all across the region, in Britain in particular, um, I think people are thinking about um, whether they can feed their children tomorrow. Is, is there a dangerous uh, such type of division, political division, like uh, in the United States happened? You said that the United States is like a two countries now. Should it happen in, uh, may it happen in Great, Great Britain? Or no? The difference is that, the, one difference is that in, um, well, Great Britain will break up, by the way, quite soon. So Scotland will become independent. Ireland will become one country. And I think Wales will want, already has a lot of independence and will want more. So to be England, okay. Difference is that Johnson never had a base uh, in the in the way that Trump still has. So Trump can still call on millions of people, can still have huge rallies, um, as we know, and was able to, you know, the American Parliament was by people with weapons, as we know. So are you still there? Scotland will be independent in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to Scotland, the blue and white flag, you know, it's the Andreevsky stand, but the other way around, you know, blue and white flag is everywhere. In Scotland, of course, they, it was a voluntary union with England. They can leave when they want to, actually. And they have their own legal system. They have their own education system. They have their own laws, which are much closer to the continent, to France, etc. Ireland will unify, and Britain, <clears throat> actually, in uh, 1998, with the Good Friday Agreement, which brought about peace in Northern Ireland, it, Britain entered into an international treaty with the Republic of Ireland, recognizing the right of the people of the island of Ireland to self-determination. Lenin's fault again, anyway. That means that as soon as there is a majority, in Northern Ireland to join the Republic, we can't stop them. 
And now Catholics are in a majority in Northern Ireland for the first time. And Sinn Féin is the biggest party. So I think Irish unification, I, I was just in Dublin for a huge rally um, addressed by Mr. Varadkar uh, from the Republic, but also leading people from the North on unification. So then, it, as I said before, it will just be England by itself. Brexit was supposed to be sovereignty and independence from the d evil dictators of Europe, you know, from the evil French who we've been fighting for hundreds of years, and the evil Germans where we won, we won the Second World War, by the way, it had nothing to do with the Soviet Union. It was Britain by itself, won the Second World War. And that's what our population are told all the time. So even though Britain, Britain lost a few hundred thousand, when Germany lost 8 million, and the Soviet Union lost 20, 30 million, I mean, a huge number. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't touch us in Britain, and we still had the empire at that time as well. We lost very, very few um, people, in that, but we were told we won that war. So Johnson, um, I can ask you again. Hello. 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 Is our so so okay. Johnson thinks he, thought he was Churchill. That was the role yeah. that he wanted to play. But the fact that he had £160,000 from the wife of the former Deputy Minister of Finance of Russia for a game of tennis, for example, and he's made Lebedev, and Lebedev, he's been to bunga bunga parties, you know what that means, in Lebedev's palace in Italy. And Lebedev, the son of the KGB head, who now owns two of the big newspapers in England, Lord Lebedev of Siberia in the House of Lords. And Johnson put him there. So just fantastic corruption we have. And we, do, we, we even didn't know about it in Ukraine. Thank you a lot. And uh, how do you think, will uh, will United Kingdom be able to continue support for Ukraine in this war against of Russia? Because the uh, United Kingdom, Kingdom gave for Ukraine more than 6 billion uh, euros uh, and a lot of uh, military support. Uh, is, is this politi politics will continue or not? How do you think? Well, as I said, we have political chaos. You know, we have the third prime minister in the course of a year. And the government is completely divided and is losing uh, to the Labour Party all the time in the opinion polls. So, uh, plus, um, Ukraine was never going to be allowed to join NATO, never ever. That was never on the cards. Nor will Ukraine be able to join the EU. That is not on the cards either. So the question is, um, the NATO countries are terrified of anything which might look like you know, entering into Ukraine. So they have, you know, Britain and other countries have, of course, a complete right legally to help Ukraine and to send arms. That's exactly what Russia has been doing in Syria. And what Russia is doing in Syria is legal in international law. But the moment uh, you have um, a no-fly zone, which Mr. Zelensky has been asking for, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And what the West is mainly doing at the moment is supplying Soviet weapons to Ukraine. You know, so and actually what Russia did not do on the 24th of February, when they bombed 280 military sites in Ukraine, they thought they were going to destroy the Ukrainian air force and air defense. Ukraine still has a very good air force, by the way. Yeah. The Russians do not have control of the sky. Yeah. Uh, and actually, you know, I, I think uh, Russia has been so... Now, the question is, can Russia lose this war? Well, I think if there's a coup in Moscow, possibly, you know, because I think Russia... See, what's happening at the moment, as you know, the young people dying in huge numbers, they are not from Moscow and St. Petersburg or Yekaterinburg, are they? They're all from ethnic republics. And, of course, we have Mr. Prigozhin, who is sending rapists and murderers to fight in Ukraine, as we know, in the Wagner group. 
and they're doing a lot of the heavy fighting. We have uh, Mr. Kadyrov's private army in Ukraine fighting on the Russian side, but no kids of the elite. I can guarantee you. I mean, no. And they, because they have not declared war, there's no war. There's only a, a special military operation for denazifying Ukraine. Uh, there is conscription, but not conscription. So a good friend of mine who is, um, uh, he was working in Memorial, uh, which is now banned in Russia, of course, uh, doing human rights work. He's also an active lawyer, was an active lawyer with KTR, which is KTR, which is the <clears throat> three million strong independent trade unions in Russia. He's the president of the Uchitel Teachers Union. Mm -hmm. And all of them, he has now, like so many people, had to escape from Russia. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so hundreds of thousands of young Russians have escaped. And in Georgia, they're getting really fed up with them because there are so many in Tbilisi. And so my friend escaped through Kazakhstan through to Turkey, managed to get um, in Turkey a visa to go to Germany. And now he is in Germany and safe. But so many of my friends in Russia have been forced. My parents cannot, my parents-in-law can't get out. There's no way they can leave. I mean, they would, I've sent them invitations, but they cannot get visas. You know, if you're Ukrainian, you can possibly get a visa to England. If you're Russian, forget it. Even if you're a strong opponent of um, Putin. So my but parents in law are desperate, really desperate, you know. Bill, but, but uh, think, think over that why Putin let uh, these people go? Because uh, many of these people we should... Well, because they were, in Russia, they would be the opposition. Yeah, that's yeah. why... Uh, because, so he's very happy to see them go because he's terrified of young people. And the thing is that young people in Russia, if they're below the age of 25, they don't watch television. They don't get Mr. Solovyov every day on Pierre Canal, um, and many of them are on Telegram and other forms. So I think Russia prefers to lose its younger generation of smart people rather than uh, have the um, danger of more of an opposition. And as you know, um, some oligarchs have left Russia. Yeah. Uh, one more question, Bill. Yeah. Uh, in your comment for Deutsche Welle, you said that uh, there should be a trial uh, on the Putin, on the on the Russian crimes in this war. Well, I haven't quite said that. Uh, what I've said is that I, it's quite right that there is. So I know the prosecutor, the new one, Karim Khan, QZ, KC, mm -hmm. of the International Criminal Court, and there is now an investigation of war crimes committed in uh, the territory of Ukraine, mm -hmm. that's proceeding. So, the, and of course, there's already been the trial in Netherlands of people responsible for MH17. The trouble is, of course, uh, that Russia has never joined the International Criminal Court, along with the United States, India, and China. So I think there will be prosecutions but nobody is going to be punished from Russia. And the difference is, you know, people say, oh, well, let's have another Nuremberg Tribunal. But of course, that followed Germany's unconditional surrender. Yeah. And Russia, I don't see any sign of an unconditional surrender from Russia. So I think all of this is a bit pointless. And when people say, oh, set up a, so uh, Philippe Sands, um, who is a leading um, a scholar on international law. He is leading a campaign uh, to, for the EU and other to set up a special tribunal on war crimes uh, because Russia, you know, as we know, Russians cannot be tried for the crime of aggression under the statute, of, you know, for good reasons, which we know. But, so... I think Russians will be prosecuted for other war crimes under the statute. But of course, um, I think the this special tribunal, okay, it's uh, propaganda, you know, it's um, 
useful material probably, but it can't affect anything. I mean, you know, when, when you have a regime in Russia which couldn't care less about international law uh, of any kind, actually, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I, I say that failing, so when we think about, I teach next term a course on international criminal justice. And we focus on, of course, on the failed attempt to get prosecutions of British leaders for Iraq. There was an investigation, but it was dropped, I think, wrongly. And there's very strong evidence against the British government for war, war crimes. There is an ongoing investigation, as you know, into war crimes committed in the occupied Palestinian territories. That's going on now. And that will be both Israelis and Palestinians. If there's evidence of war crimes, so it's not against Israel. This is war, and this is similar to the investigation uh, being carried out now as we speak in Ukraine. Problem is, of course, Israel is not going to give up its citizens uh, for prosecution, um, nor is Russia going to give up its. As we know, I mean, what we haven't mentioned yet is that there are interstate complaints. So there have been, um, in various uh, fora, uh, so there have been in the um, European Convention on Human Rights, but Russia has been expelled now. So uh, there have been cases, as you know, between Georgia and Russia over the 2008 war, uh, interstate cases. And there are cases in United Nations bodies of Ukraine against Russia, as we know. And Russia has not left the United Nations yet. Uh, so that means that Russia is still open to claims in the International Court of Justice. And, and you know as well as I do, uh, the Ukraine has cases on the go at this moment in time against uh, Russia. But so. All, all all, uh, but everything should be changed if the Russia will be defeated, military defeated. Well, do you think that's going to happen? I think there is a only small chance. Right, I would say there's no chance. Why? Because I've been in the Far East of Russia, it's 10 hours flying, 10 hours flying from Khabarovsk to Moscow, okay? And it's 140 million people. And they have still not called, you know, they still haven't declared war. And so I think the only way that the war can end, actually, is through the fall of the regime in Moscow. Yeah. So I don't think that that would not be Russia. I think Russia, if they, if the Russian people will continue to put up with hundreds of thousands of young people dying, in a, something which isn't even a war, as far as Russia is concerned. You know, if Putin, Putin, he's two years younger than me, but he looks older, does he not? Yeah. And every time you see him, he looks more sick. But then what will we get if he goes? You know, we will get somebody else from the um, Secret Service, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I, I think all... I think Russia is losing. It looks like there's going to be another Russian offensive across the Belarusian border. Looks like that they will try that one again. Yeah. But right. I think, by the way, the Ukrainian military are pretty clever, as they have shown many times. And they have got some good weapons. And they've also, what Putin has done is made Ukraine much more patriotic than it was. Before 2014. Yes, and, you know, and as you know, I was very much involved in the when I came to interview you. That was to do with the question of Russian language, uh, yes. Russia joining the languages charter, and as as you know, actually, before the Maidan, the law had been changed to allow much more autonomy um, in with regard to the Russian language, and. But there was ne never any question I, I, that I could see of Russian language being prohibited or anything like that. On the contrary, I mean, I was in Kiev so many times 
everything is written in Ukrainian, everyone is speaking Russian. It, it, was, it was before. You will not see... Oh, it. Now, now it's changed. Now it's changed. Yeah. So I, I was teaching... Uh, did you do your doctorate at Kiev, Mahila? I can't remember. Was it your PhD? Well, when I mentioned last time, you were studying... I, 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 studied, I studied a PhD program in Kiev McGill Academy, but yeah, exactly. I, I, I haven't finished it. Ah, same. Because as you know, I was teaching there. And as you know, it was forbidden... Uh, so the teaching had to be in English or Ukrainian. Yeah. And, but I had the experience of speaking to the Nauchni Soviet. Um, and I had to ask their permission. So I said, I'm really sorry. Um, I don't speak Ukrainian. So mm -hmm. could you give me permission to speak to you in Russian? And so they voted, yeah, that I could speak to them in Russian. Okay. So I made a... Then, after my speech... I noticed most of them were speaking to each other in Russian. <laughs> so, and the, you know, as you know, the students of Kiev Mahila, I mean, they are basically cool kids like anywhere, and they speak Russian and Ukrainian. At that time, that was quite a few years ago. What's happening now is, of course, Russia has done such damage to Russian culture, uh, to the image of Russia, you know, I, I think that is one of the huge tragedies of this war is what's happening, actually, to Russian language and Russian culture. You know, Russia, I speak Russian fluently. Uh, we speak Russian at home. And I love uh, Russian culture. But this is all because, you know, this is horrific, isn't it? Yeah. What's going on? So uh, you probably speak Ukrainian and Russian. I mean, most people I met in Ukraine have both languages, but, you know. Uh, okay, and uh, in, the, in such situation for Ukrainians now, give, please give a practical advice to ordinary Ukrainians on what instruments of international legal protection they can use now and how they can, can and prepare uh, for these processes. Right. So I, I would say you still have the European Convention on Human Rights. Yeah. And I've been involved in big cases against Ukraine also. Um, you still have the Languages Charter, strangely enough, because you did, you ratified it, you unratified it, and then you ratified it again. Uh, Bill, and Bill, you're I'm still in the Council of Europe, so you're in the Framework Convention for the Production uh, of National yeah, Bill, one, one second, Bill. I am not talking about the language talki topic. Uh, I am talking about the Russian intervention in general. How uh, for, for Ukrainians prepare uh, they yourself for uh, for damage, uh, for fixing the damage of our property, health, or something yeah. like this, about war crimes? So, I think the first thing is the fantastic damage that Russia has done. I mean, I think this is the mo this is terrorism, by the way, and it's war crimes to be targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure in this way. Uh, and I think it's amazing how the Ukrainian government and people have uh, been so resilient, but it's going to cost billions and trillions to rebuild. Uh, I think that is what um, people in the rest of the world will have to get used to, is the idea, I think the damage has been done. This is similar to the damage that was done in Germany as a result of losing the Second World War. And of course, that was the difference between East Germany and West Germany. East Germany, the Soviets took everything. <laughs> they had to start with nothing. Whereas in the West, they had the Marshall Plan. And I would say that it will need a Marshall Plan for the rebuilding of Ukraine. And that, that is minimum. Okay. War crimes, that will, so let's say, uh, you know, there is a coup in Moscow tomorrow. Let's say that somehow or another, it's liberal forces that uh, take power. Well, I think it's more likely to be the FSB again, but anyway. You could see a situation where maybe um, a different Russia would recognize that war crimes were committed in uh, Ukraine. But, um, you know, uh, 
Uh, my dream would be, I'm probably too old now, would be to get honorary citizenship of Russia, Patsotny Grosanstvo, Rosyjski Federatsie. And I think if Depardieu could get it from Putin, you know, I think I'm entitled to it, actually, um, if there was a different regime in Russia, but I don't think there will be. I think Russia is likely to break up further, if you ask my opinion. Uh, I don't see how actually the Federation can be kept together. I think Russia has, I think the regime has lost the young people, not just the smart people who've been able to leave, I mean, educated people, but I think the younger generation in Russia actually um, uh, are still going to prison in huge numbers. I mean, just um, so I think Russia has lost the younger generation. Plus, Nobody talks about now, but I've written about this. There's still an AIDS epidemic in Russia. And they're suffering, actually, not just COVID, but AIDS, as you know, um, HIV and AIDS among uh, young people. The Russian population is still falling rapidly. And that is a major problem for conscription. I think that's one reason that war has not been declared. Because every year it's harder and harder to call people up uh, into the Russian military. So, and I think Russia has, I mean, they were beginning to address the question of the, of the population in Russia and the AIDS epidemic among young people. And, you know, I've been working, I was working with the Russian police years ago uh, on the question of uh, uh, AIDS and HIV and nihilism among young people in Russia. And for young people in Russia, they think, what is the future? You know, I think in Ukraine now, young people are fighting for their motherland. Very different situation, you know. Thank you a lot. Uh, thank you a lot. Bill Bovrin, uh, professor of the law from United Kingdom and a big friend of Ukraine and big friend of the uh, all independent thinking. Thank you a lot, Bill. It was... Sorry, uh, sorry, for, sorry for arguing with you, but uh, you know, that's how it is. No, so. it, it's great, because I, 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 I'm also often, I'm not right, uh, also often, eh, it's very good to think in other thoughts. Uh, I'm absolutely open person. I am not... Uh, uh, I, I'm lucky to, to, to hear any uh, discussion, to take a participation. Yeah, yeah. And I think Ukraine has changed so much. Uh, since extremely, I was doing the work on languages. Much. Extremely much. For example, uh, in my family home, there is no electricity more than 40 hours for now. Right. Uh, we have a lot of different changes. Uh, not all of them are good, but many of them are very historical. No, it's a different country. So I, I don't say that Zelensky saves the world, not for a moment. I, I think there are huge problems, of course. And I don't think corruption in Ukraine, you know what's going on with the judges? It's horrifying. horrifying. Thank you a lot, Bill. Thank you for this TV program. And uh, see you. I, I will be lucky to see you again in this interview in the summer in the future. Thank you a lot. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.